uh, volunteered to do a couple of extra work uh, before the summer school and uh, I uh, spent <laughs> quite a couple of hours on compiling a tree species point data set, point occurrence data set for the European, uh, yeah, for all the European EU countries. Um, basically, I harmonized a couple of existing databases, so I didn't do any uh, field work <laughs> or something related. Um, so before I, I start, just a couple of words about myself, so you know where, I'm, where I come from and, and, and what I roughly do. So um, I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in geography from universities of Munich and uh, Bayreuth in, in southern Germany. Um, but the, my enthusiasm for, for geospatial data science and, and remote sensing came from internships and thesis. I spent some time at the German Aerospace Center um, at the United Nations, but also um, at the US Forest Service, where I started experimenting with how to model fire and wildfire. And um, this has led me to my PhD project, which I started just a couple of months ago at the University of Münster, where we'll model wildfire has a potential for Germany. Um, so, Let's jump into the data that I looked at for, for this little compilation. So here you see the main three databases where all the points come from. And you probably all heard of GBIF, which is uh, like the largest biodiversity information database. And uh, I compiled about 3 million points in total. And I'd say about 80 to 85% come from GBIF. GBIF itself has hundreds of of data sets that scientists can up upload um, after they complete their own research. And um, so I think about 190 data sets just come from GBIF. Uh, the other two you see here are, are minor. Um, the Lucas uh, survey from Eurostat uh, just has a couple, like 100,000 points um, and is not as detailed. And the EU forest data set on the bottom right here uh, is a recent public publication um, with about five to 600,000 point uh, occurrences. All right, I now want to switch to uh, showing you what kind of code I used and, and how my process was roughly. Um, give me a sec. So, First, of course, I needed to download. Sorry, I'm not going to try not to bore you with, uh, with details. If anyone is interested in some more specifics, then just please raise your hand and ask or, or just shout. Um, I briefly, I don't want to show you all the download stuff. I just want to show you that the, our GBIF package exists and it's very easy to use. You can uh, first query a couple of occurrences up by like taxon name and so on, and then uh, set up a little um, download request and our GBIF then processes your download and it even has a couple of functions that tell you how far your uh, request is and afterwards you get a big zip file usually that you can download after a couple of minutes. So that's just as a hint um, about the, the data. So here you see a list of, okay, let's start here, but um, here you see a list of tree species. This is about 104 different ones that I included. Some just have a couple of points, some have multiple hundreds of thousands. Um, so that's that. I will go through the data cleaning process just briefly um, for GBIF and then skip the other two data sets because uh, we don't want to repeat all the things three times. Um, so GBIF comes with 240 different variables. 250 columns, 240 columns. Uh, so you can imagine data sets kind of large if you download a couple of million points. Um, that's why I substituted it first and uh, tried to get a bigger picture of how things look. Um, of course, some filtering is necessary. As you can see, my original download had about 6 million points, many of what, which did not have any nice coordinate data or were not in some projection system. So um, <laughs> right there, we, we, we kicked out about 4 million of them. I 
uh, filter out a couple of things. Um, yeah, as I said, if, if you have have questions about the specifics, please contact me or, or maybe look up the file, which might be available soon uh, online, I hope. Maybe ask uh, Tom, he knows more about how things will develop from here on. Um, do you mean this last line here? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just keeping the ones that, that are less than five kilometers. Yeah. Exactly. Um, no worries. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's probably best to, to look at that yourself if you should ever be interested in the data. Um, one uh, interesting thing, as I mentioned, GBIF, my GBIF data comes from 190 different data sets and uh, I wanted to make sure to give credit to every single different researcher who, who contributed. So uh, our GBIF has a function that extracts the citation of um, a single data set. So um, if, you, if you use my points, you will have uh, citations for, for every single data set still. I um, yeah, think that's uh, one of the more important things. I established a couple of quality flags, meaning um, that I used a couple of metadata points from, from the existing data sets to indicate whether uh, it's useful to, ex to have a point or not, or at least so you know that you should maybe be aware of some issues that are related. Um, I established two, or first of all, sorry, you see uh, how many of these issues occur. So there were points that, or some, some issues where 100,000 100, um, coordinates or points had, let's say, slight problems let's, uh, overall. And sometimes um, <laughs> we had kind of unimportant issues. Um, anyway, I established two flags, one for location issues. So if uh, precisions were, were not valid or uh, the geodetic datum was not valid, then um, it got flag number one. If the location accuracy was worse than 500 points, uh, uh, 500 meters, sorry, then I also gave them a little flag um, just so people can, can subset more easily later if they select their data for modeling. Um, also, a couple of points had date issues. Sometimes the year uh, in which the data was sampled was missing, so this is also indicated. And um, finally, uh, yeah, you see an overview. GBIF data usually has no problems with, uh, with dates, but it does have a couple of issues with uh, locations. So zero means it's fine, but um, this means flag two means location accuracy is pretty bad. So this were about 800,000 points, which had very poor accuracy. Um, of course, then I have to create a spatial object. I used SF for that because uh, it's it's nicely integrated in all the tidyverse processes. And uh, one one reason I, I I took this project on was to have a real reason to use all the uh, tidyverse data cleaning things. And uh, it's nice that SF just finally works with that. Um, as I said, I'm going to skip the EU forest data and the Lucas points because it's more or less the same. They are way less complex. Um, they have way less variables. So um, I'm going to skip that and go to the part where I assemble the data set. So after I check if everything is more or less the same, if they're valid to, to, to merge or to bind, um, I, I bind the leftover about 3 million points. Um, I, of course, if you use many points, you have to start thinking about speed. And I found that the uh, rbind list from, from the data.table package is uh, just mind blowing <laughs> when you compare it to the traditional base uh, rbind function. Um, afterwards, there had to be some cleaning that only made sense after the, the data was already bound. bound. So um, yeah, cleaning up the mess with different naming conventions for countries, for example, um, yeah ugly but useful uh, and this is how many how many points are 
falling into which country for boundaries. So uh, we see that Spain um, has, yeah, by far the most, followed by Great, Great Britain and France. So Central Europe, Germany, uh, Sweden up there, I think has a has a lot of points and it gets less and less. No, this is absolute values. Um, just to give you an, uh, a rough idea. So I, uh, I used the second country mask that was provided by Tom. It's a 30 meter raster that uh, just indicates whether this is land or not, whether a point lies somewhere in the ocean or not. And um, this, I mean, is not very exciting, but uh, I wanted to point out that um, I used the, rust, uh, the Terra package that Tom was just mentioning earlier and um, specifically the extract command. So I can use an SF object, which is this one, um, turned into a Terra vector and use extract. And uh, for 3 million points, it took me about three to four minutes, which on this laptop, I think is pretty amazing um, compared to what I tried before. <laughs> Further on, I extracted Korean land cover data at 100 meter resolution. Um, this is also to make subsetting more easily. Um, if you, yeah, you can, can decide yourself which points to keep and which not, but it definitely makes sense to, to plot Korean data um, after you subsetted the data for your own modeling, just to get an idea which points maybe are located in cities like in parks and stuff, um, might not be suitable for yeah, mod modeling forests or stuff. Um, the yeah, three here is an example of, of Korean data for three um, forest classes that they have. So um, you saw that. Uh, yeah, if after the extraction, I saw that most of the points actually fall into forest that, forested areas, so this is half a million points each for, for these two forest classes, but also a couple of uh, 100,000 points fall into agricultural land classes, and this is probably due to the fact that many of the points in GBIF come from big raster cells that are just computed to a centroid. So let's say if you have a one by one square where there's a lot of forest, but there's also other land use, then the centroid might not be in the forest, but somewhere else. So um, if you see that if you start um, yeah, viewing single points uh, in the landscape, which appears a little odd sometimes. I, I removed only the ones that are less or worse than 5,000 meters. The ones that are less than 500, they have a flag for, for quality. Um, so further, yeah, you could, you can easily filter, I, well, I think my work's done <laughs> with this data set, but you can easily filter all the ones that have an accuracy of 500 meters by default and, and push them to the closest forest boundary, maybe. I think that's, exactly. True, yeah, no, you're right. Um, you can also use buffers around your forests, maybe, yeah. So extent of occurrence is um, a, uh, yeah, a data set that comes with the EU forest uh, data set that I mentioned earlier. So these are very vague boundaries of where natural habitat of a species lies. They have about 200 different species listed. And I applied a, a very simple um, uh, intersection with my points for, for the matching species. So all Fargo sylvatica points are matched with, a, um, with this boundary to just give one and zero flags indicating if this point of this species is actually in a range where it belongs traditionally, kind of um, naturally, or if it lies outside. Sometimes if you maybe have a nice little park in, let's say, Oslo, Norway, or somewhere else outside this boundary, 
then you would get um, a flag for for not being in the right or natural um, range. This was only not available for for these five different species, so most of them actually have this type type of information. Um, most of them, right? So uh, this this number indicates 2.7 million indicates that uh, most most of the points actually lie where they should, so within the natural habitats. Um, one issue that I just found kind of late was uh, that many locations are duplicates. So if you have an observation that maybe um, has been made over a bunch of different years, then it's in that database for a bunch of different years. And so far I decided to leave them in. People can decide themselves if they wanna um, keep uh, all the all the points for different years or, or if they wanna filter them. Um, maybe you wanna do a historical map, only treat data from the 1950s or so. Um, so yeah, I'll leave that to you. Um, so yeah, let's get to, to the more fun part. You haven't really seen much of, of the points yet. Um, so I, I plotted a couple of maps, one indicating the density of these occurrence points as you, as you already saw in, in the bar chart earlier. Um, France and, and especially Spain and Central Europe show, show a higher density in points, while especially Norway, but also the uh, east and southeast of Germany are rather poor compared. Um, we can skip the summary, I would suggest, and see that um, in terms of time, most of the data actually was uploaded in the past 20 years. I cannot, I cannot really verify if data was actually uh, sampled in the past 20 years, or if with the <laughs> onset of the internet, people just were uploading things and put a timestamp on the date they uploaded their data. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but this is what, what GBIF and the other data sets provide. Um, yeah, let's, let's skip that for now. Here you once more see the distribution of where the data comes from, just to keep in mind that GBIF is mostly the, um, yeah, provides the main, main part of this data. I prepared a, just a tiny example of how an, a subset could look like that you might want to use. So um, I want to use all the pine species that are present in Germany. I only want to use data that comes from GBIF and from the EU forest data set, um, and only the ones that are rather recent. They shouldn't have any location problems or date problems. And if I subset it that way, I get about 1600 species or sorry, uh, occurrences. And with a quick map view, I can see um, how they are distributed. So um, this could be a quick approach of how to get the data you wanna use for a little um, species distribution modeling task or something like that. All right, um, I can't really see much. Of course, there is a documentation if you happen to have questions, I'm, I'm happy to forward it, or maybe Tom will, will announce some time where things are stored. So this explains for every single um, variable how they were derived, where they come from. In this case here, um, the red stuff was derived from data, the green stuff was already existing in the databases, and the blue stuff had to be added manually because it was missing in either one of the data sets. All right, um, let's give Hugus the chance, time to shine. So this is how our three million points look like. You might have seen it already with, with in, in Tom's um, QGIS earlier. If you take some time, I tried to use very small points here. So if you take some time, you can already see where more sparse regions are, especially in Northern Norway, uh, but also uh, parts of, of, of eastern Poland and um, and generally southeastern Germany it looks um, pretty data sparse, while the rest is very very dense or mostly dense. 
Um, for example, southern Spain is, is one of the regions that is very dense, um, which is nice to see. But also um, in northern Germany, you can really nicely see where aggregated data comes from. So I'm pretty sure this is, for example, these one kilometer squares that were just um, just uh, converted to a centroid. Um, so nice and even, probably mostly forest inventory data. Um, then again, as I mentioned, Croatia is in mostly almost no data available. Maybe this uh, will happen in the future if people know people and can maybe persuade them to, to contribute their data because according to Tom, data is everywhere. I just need to con convince a couple of people maybe. Uh, and finally, let's take a quick look how, how our area in Bacheningen looks like. So um, yeah, we are sitting right here. And so this is the closest tree you can find, <laughs> which is just uh, down the road or, or over the road. And um, you can see here that this is a maple tree, uh, which was sampled in 2019. It's, yeah, it is in GBIF. Um, location accuracy could be better, but it's somewhere around here. Definitely, we can see that on the map. And uh, yeah, this is the data you can you can now easily get, and maybe even more nicely visualize once the whole flat geo buffer thing has kicked off. Really. <laughs> 